the path of life, we are right now in a, in a series looking at the feasts of the Old Testament. And just as the song the choir just sang, uh, going to the River Jordan, Israel passed through Jordan to go where? The promised land. Thousands of years later, Jesus is baptized where? To show us the real way to the promised land. The path of light, Deuteronomy 16, 11. And rejoice before the Lord your God at the place He will choose as a what? Dwelling place for His name. The good news, friends, is the place that God has chosen to be His dwelling place for His name is your heart. It's your life. We're examining seven feasts of the Old Testament, which really are seven feasts that represented Israel's journey from Egypt to Canaan. But more than that, they illustrate the journey we all have to take from salvation to transformation, from Passover to Jubilee. They teach us a very fundamental thing, and that is God's intention was never just to save you. His intention is to radically change you. The first feast season made up of the Passover, which pointed to what? The cross. Then you had the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That pointed to what? The tomb. And then the first fruits pointed to what? Resurrection. This first feast season... Made up of the Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits, it gives us peace. Why? Well, because it is the assurance that God passed over your past. He took your sins and he buried them in the tomb, all so that you can be resurrected and remade in him. 2 Thessalonians reiterates this 2.13. God chose you. You didn't choose God. God chose you. That's what God told Israel. God said, I didn't, you didn't choose me, I chose you. God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. You see, after God saves you and then he remakes you and he buries you, then he can do something with you. But it's not until uh, uh, we die to self and we, he buries our past and we're remade in the image of God That he can do something with us. See, that message, the Passover season message, brings peace. Because it tells me I once was lost, but now I'm found. But friends, we need more than God's peace to make it from salvation to transformation. We need God's power. We need the power of God in our hearts. Because you see, God did not save you just to save you. God saved you so that he could use you to lead other people to salvation. You see, friends, church is not just a place where you go to get your needs met. Church is a place for meeting the needs of the world through you. The church is the place that God had called to to set the captives free and to feed the poor. The church is to be the place that goes out in pearl and cuts down trees and feeds people. It was never God's intention for, for public organizations and these other various organizations to take care of that. That was the role of the church. Church is not just a place where you go to meet your needs. It's a God's place for meeting the needs of the world through your life. The season of Pentecost represents the second major encounter God wants to have with you today. It celebrated God's encounter with Israel there at Mount Sinai when God gave his holy law to his people. The Feast of Pentecost happened 50 days, seven weeks after the Feast of First Roots. That's why the feast is also called the Feast of Weeks. Seven weeks went from First Fruits to the Feast of Pentecost. You see, the Passover marked the beginning of the barley harvest, but the Feast of Pentecost was the beginning of the wheat harvest. 
The celebration only lasted one day and it consisted of a wave offering of two loaves of, of, of bread baked with leaven. The bread was made with a very fine flour that was sifted, sifted, and sifted to separate anything that was any sort of impurity from the wheat. For the Jews, Pentecost was about God coming down at Sinai, but for the Christian, it's about God coming down in our life and setting us on fire for Him. Exodus 19.60 this is the first Pentecost experience of God's people. On the morning of the third day, there were what? Come on, we can do better than that. <laughs> on the morning of the third day, there were what? Yeah, that sounds like thunder and lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Now, the Hebrew word for thunders is the same word for voices. And the Hebrew word for lightning means a fire that comes down from the sky. So you could actually translate this Hebrew verse saying, voices of fire filled the camp for all people. Psalms 29.7 says, the voice of the Lord flashes forth with flames of what? God came down at Sinai to make a covenant with his people. And when he spoke, they saw voices of fire. And after he speaks, the people are so wowed by this experience. If you saw people speak with tongues of fire, you would be wowed too. And notice what the people say. All the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will what? And you would probably say the same thing if you had just seen that. The problem is, just a few days later, these people tell Aaron to get up and make them an idol. How long do you think it took for them to go from, Lord, we'll do whatever you ask, to Aaron, get up and make us an idol? Well, we know that Moses was only up in the mountain for 40 days. He was only up in Sinai for 40 days. That's not very long. And I'm sure it took a long time for them to gather all of the gold in the camp. There was a lot of people in that camp. And so they gathered up the gold, and, and then they had to fashion a mold of a, of a calf, and, and then they had to melt down the gold, and then they had to put it in the mold and, and fashion it into a golden calf. And I'm, and I'm sure it took several days for the people to get up the nerve to actually go up to Aaron and tell him to make the calf. They didn't ask him to make the calf. They told him to make the calf. And as we know, sin begins in our brains long before it makes its way to our hands, doesn't it? And so I would suggest a few days at most pass by before Israel made the decision they were going to sin. No idols? We got you, God. We'll do whatever you ask. Next second, hey, I got an idea. Let's make an idol. But if we're all honest here, honest here, how many times have you said, Lord, I won't ever do that again, only to do it again? How many times have we said, Lord, I'll do whatever you ask, only to never do anything that he asks? I won't go to that website again. Never again, Lord, I promise. Lord, you get me past the judge. I won't use dope anymore. Lord, I won't go back to the bottle again. I won't go gossiping again. And I won't doubt you anymore. I won't worry again. I'm not going to lash out in anger anymore. We say these things only to run back to them the moment temptation comes. In fact, some of us right now are already thinking how we're going to sin when we leave church today. <laughs> some of us are already doing it right here in the church tear people down with our minds and we have contempt for our own brothers and sisters here in the pews and this is why you don't just need God to save you you need the power from on high and tragically because of Israel's sin 3,000 died that day now God gave them a choice remember this if any of us end up in hell it's because we chose to go there God gave his people a choice. They chose wrong. The 12 tribes, had, if they had allowed God to fill them at the first Pentecost experience at Sinai, God never would have had to fill the 12 disciples at the day of Pentecost centuries later. 
It was because the 12 tribes failed to be the church that God had to raise up the 12 disciples to be his new church. And so my question to you today, is there a ministry God wants you to do, but he has to raise somebody else up to do it because you're unwilling to do it? In fact, there's people in this church doing 20 other people's jobs God has for them to do, but because you won't do it, he's got to ask somebody else to do it. Israel rejected God time and time again until the point where God had to say, I can't use you anymore. Friends, Israel is proof you don't mess around with the Holy Spirit. At the first Pentecost, God put his words on tablets of stone. He gave him, them, his love words. They were the marriage vows between us and God. They're not rules we keep in order to earn God's love. No, they're words we keep because God gave us, us his love free, no charge. It was there at that first Pentecost that God gave those tablets of stone. But there would come a time when God would put those laws in our hearts. Jeremiah 31, 33 says, I will put my law where? And I will write it on their where? And I will be their God and they shall be my people. You see, friends, that is what God wants from you more than anything. And it's the thing he's trying to be, he's been trying to get a people to understand since the beginning. He wants a people who want him as their God rather than themselves as their God. So maybe, friends, when you first joined the church, you received the law in stone. You saw the truth. You saw the commandments. Well, now he wants to take that law of stone and he wants to put it in your heart. Through the Pentecost experience, he wants you to start seeing the Sabbath not as a way to appease some distant God, but he wants you to start seeing the Sabbath as a date with your, with your lover. He wants you to start seeing the church as a hospital for the broken instead of a building for your entertainment. He wants to remove the idols from the pedestal of your heart so that he can finally put his name there because until you live for God, you're going to live for something else. And you were created from the ground up to live for God. Man, I spent most of my life trying to live for Richie and it about killed me. But the day I started living for God... It changed me. Israel would come to Jerusalem every year for the Feast of Pentecost, waiting for God to fulfill the promise that he was going to put his law in his people's heart. They were finally going to be obedient. He was going to finally uproot these pagan nations. And for 1,500 years, Israel went home disappointed. But then Jesus showed up. Luke 3.16, John the Baptist says, He who is mightier, mightier than I is coming. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He's going to baptize you with what? Holy Spirit and fire. You see, friends, Jesus fulfilled the season of Passover as the Lamb who died for your sins, but He also fulfills the season of Pentecost as the glorified Lord who baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. Pentecost represents the second major encounter we've got to have with God. We need to know him not only as the lamb who died for our sins. We need to know him as the king who is right now at the right hand of God. Look, Jesus was with the disciples for three and a half years. He tells them, I want you to be fishers of men now. No, more, no, more, no longer fishermen of, of fish. I want you to be fishers of men. And so he takes them for three and a half years and he works with them and he disciples them and he shows them what the church should look like, loving people. And, 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 but yet they still found themselves bickering about who was going to be the best and who was going to be the first. And then even after Jesus dies and is resurrected, where does Jesus find them? He finds them hiding, but then even after that, he finds them back to fishing fish. They watched him heal the sick and cast out demons, but when Jesus is arrested, they run scared. And then in John 13, 37, 38, notice Peter, 
I will lay down my life for you, Jesus. I will do whatever you say, Jesus. And Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me, Peter? Because the rooster will not even crow before you've denied me three times. You see, Jesus was at Sinai when Israel said, Lord, we'll do whatever you ask, and then proceed to make decisions to disobey him. Jesus was there when Peter said that he would die for him and then proceed to deny him three times before the next day. And don't just come down on Peter because the Bible says all the disciples did the same thing. They all said they were going to die for him and they all disappeared when he died. Which is why in John, the second chapter, verse 25, it says no one needed to tell him, Jesus, what people what mankind is really like. You see, friends, that's why we don't have to come to Jesus with charades, because he knows what we're really like. He knows what you're going through. He knows the pain in your heart. You don't have to put on the fake plastic smile. You can come in here and say, Jesus, I need your power in my life. And it's because Jesus knows what's in us that he tells the disciples that it's better for him to go so that the comforter can come. This is why even after seeing Jesus conquer death and stand in their midst, even after they put their fingers through the holes in his hands, he still tells them to wait in Jerusalem until you receive my power because knowledge is not enough. You need my power. Knowing the Sabbath is on Saturday is not enough. You need power to honor God and keep it holy. Knowing the Sabbath is Saturday isn't doing anything for you. You need power to obey Him. Knowing that you should be in churches is not enough. Man, I was out in, uh, using drugs and knew I should have been at church. You need power in order to make it here dedicated every Sabbath. You see, knowing the fighting between you and your spouse is hurting your kids is not enough. You need the power to stop fighting. Knowing you have a negative spirit does not get rid of your negative spirit. It is only by the Holy Spirit burning in your life that you can get a new spirit. We need more than just knowledge, friends. We need more than just truth. You know, we have the truth, but does the truth have you? We need more than just knowledge. We need power. Lord, I need power to do what I should do, and I know I should do, but I just can't ever do it. I need power to stop the lusting, and I need power to stop the cussing, and I need power to forgive the resentment and let go of the bitterness and let the past stay in the past. I need your power because I'm powerless. And that is the role of the Holy Spirit. It's to empower you to do the things that you could never do on your own. It's to do the impossible in your life. But until you step out in faith and allow God to do the impossible in you, you will not experience the impossible. Often the reason why we don't experience Holy Spirit power is because we don't step out where the Holy Spirit has to step in. Acts 1.8 But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God does not just want to save you to save you. He wants to make you an instrument through which he will save others. In fact, friends, it's in the action of working and laboring for saving others that you yourself are going to stay in a position of salvation. Because it is a good litmus test as whether I am walking in the Spirit. Am I bearing fruits of the Spirit or not? This was the significance of Pentecost. With the first encounter, God rewrote your past. With the second, he's giving you power for your present. You don't just need forgiveness, man. You need power. I mean, it wasn't until Pentecost, really, that Peter and the other disciples became fisher, fishers of men. Because that's when they got the power. They still made mistakes. 
They still were sinners, but their entire orientation changed. You see, church stopped being about them, and it became about others and God. And then this little group of ordinary men and women started turning the world upside down for him. They began a revolution that no one could stop. In fact, the Bible says even Jesus needed to be filled by the Holy Spirit before beginning his earthly ministry. Notice what the Bible says. Luke 4.14, and Jesus returned in the power of the what? And a report about him went through all the surrounding countries. Friends, if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit to do the work on earth that he was called to do, then you need the Holy Spirit to do the work and live the life that God wants you to live. And then to really stress it, in John 14, 12, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, verily, verily, I say to you, whoever believes in me, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do and greater works than these he will do because I'm going to the Father. And when Jesus went to the Father, he sent the Spirit. Now, how in the world is that possible? I mean, Jesus walked on water. Jesus healed the sick. He he breathed life into the dead and they came alive. How can we ever do more than Jesus? Well, when Jesus walked the earth, he was limited to one body and he was limited to one place and he was limited to one time. But now he's at the right hand of God and by the Holy Spirit, he can be everywhere and anywhere all at once. Which means he doesn't just want to be around you. He doesn't just want to be by you. Jesus wants to be burning inside of your life. God still wants to use ordinary men and women to turn the world upside down for him. But we need his power. If we keep relying on pastors to do the job, we'll never finish the work. But when a church of of 10, 20, 100, 200 ordinary men and women come along, man, they can start a revolution that can't be stopped. That's what Pentecost is about. 50 days were between first fruits and Pentecost. 50 days were between the resurrection of Christ and the outpouring of the Spirit on Pentecost. Forty of these days Jesus spends with his disciples, instructing them, kind of like the 40 days that he spent with Moses on Sinai, instructing him. And then Jesus ascends, and for 10 days, the 11 disciples, they continued in prayer and supplication. But what's amazing about this story, friends, is not only were the 10 days important for us on earth, but they were important in heaven. You read Revelation 5, and what you're reading is, it it is giving you a glimpse of Jesus' coronation in heaven after ascending to the right hand of God. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And Revelation 5.10 says, And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. This is the fulfillment of the promise God gave at the first Pentecost at Sinai. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Jesus fulfilled the feast of Pentecost when he was crowned king in heaven and sent the Holy Spirit to earth. It was a fulfillment of what God had promised, that he would write his laws in our hearts. John 12, 23 through 24, and Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be what? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears what? Jesus was talking about himself as the human grain of wheat who died so that your life could bear fruit. The loaves of bread for the wave offering at Pentecost were made with a very fine flour. You see, all the impurities were removed. It was crushed, it was sifted, it was baked so that it could become bread. Well, friends, Jesus was crushed and he was sifted and he was buried for our sins so that we might become the church. 120 of Jesus' followers gathered in the upper room waiting in prayer and supplication for this blessed event. And in Acts chapter 2, 1 through 8, it happened. 
When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were together in one place. If you compare this with Acts 19, they are very, uh, so many parallels. And suddenly there came from heaven and a sound like of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were filled with what? And began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were Dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. On this day, thousands of Jews came to Jerusalem to celebrate the encounter of God and his people at Sinai. And while it's true that God gave them the law on this day, what Pentecost is really about, what, what what we really need most, what Israel really needed most, what we all desperately need most is not just knowledge of the law, but we need power to obey it. The real promise was he was giving us power to actually live the law. At Pentecost, God removed the language barrier. He undid what our sin did at Babel. The disciples spoke languages they didn't know. And just as at Sinai, the people saw tongues of fire and the Holy Spirit spoke to them in their native language. Peter stood up and man, that rascal preached his heart out. The same one who had denied Jesus now was preaching Jesus. 3,000 died at Sinai because of the rejection of the Holy Spirit. But this time, instead of 3,000 dying, 3,000 were saved. And it happened the moment Jesus was being crowned king. And it happened the exact moment the Jews were offering the wave offering of the two loaves in the temple. During the Feast of Unleavened Bread, barley loaves were used because, you see, they were without leaven. You need barley to make unleavened bread. They were without leaven because they represented Jesus who is sinless and who was sinless. But what's interesting is is the wheat loaves at Pentecost were baked with leaven. Leaven is sin. So who in the world do these loaves represent? They represent the church. They represent you and me. Because you see, friends, although we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified, we are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That although we all have leaven in our life, we have leaven coming out of our ears, when you receive Christ as Savior and Lord, you receive His power. That when Israel said, we will obey everything, they didn't. And when Peter said, I will die for you, he didn't. At least not yet. And so Jesus turns to him and he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. And what's amazing to me, what is mind-boggling to me, is that instead of giving Israel what they deserved, which was to wipe them out, they're stiff-necked people, they're never going to get it, I'm going to wipe them out. Instead of doing that, God gave them mercy. And instead of giving Peter what he deserved, which was to give Peter to the devil to be sifted for his sin, instead of giving any of us what we deserve, Jesus allowed himself to be sifted and buried and killed. So that we could be released, so that he could be released into our lives, our sin-filled lives, our leaven-filled bread, and we can still be a wave offering that is pleasing to God. Because when you accept Christ as Savior and Lord, God no longer sees your sin. He sees his perfect son. You can be what God wants you to be. Because Jesus Christ was everything we should have been, but, but, but weren't. Let your life be a wave offering to God. Let his Holy Spirit fill you. He'll give you the power to overcome your sin. But you got to get out of the way. you got to get up off the throne of your heart and let God reign supreme of your life. Friends, let him make your heart his dwelling place. 
Are you willing to let God make your heart His dwelling place? If you want to say, yes, Jesus, I want to surrender all to you, will you raise your hand right now to heaven? Lord, I want you to do amazing things. You're inviting the Holy Spirit into your life to give you new life. Right now, I pray, most gracious Heavenly Father, that you would fill the lives of each person here. That you would pour out your Holy Spirit on your people because, Lord, we lack the power. Lord, we lack the power to wake up in the morning if you didn't charge and wake us up. We lack the power to, to make our lungs work, but you make our lungs work. So, Lord, we, we need power to do anything. And so we pray that you would fill us with your power this day. That whatever obstacle we're facing, you would fill us with your spirit and you'll overcome the obstacle. That whatever storms we're facing, you reign in us now because of the Holy Spirit and you calm the storm. I pray, Lord, you speak to our heart right now that if God is with us, who can be against us? Lord, I pray you fill each person here with your Holy Spirit that we would finish the work you've called us to do. We know the truth, Lord. I pray that today we'll allow the truth to have us. So, Lord, we need victory over the negative thinking. We need victory over the, the fear that so often cripples the church. We need victory over the disunity and the cliques that can appear in the church. We need power to overcome the addictions and power to overcome the depression and, and power to overcome this life and to be ready for the next. I pray you give us that power. I pray you give our children power and our loved ones power to overcome the obstacles they face that, Lord, you would let them know right now that you love them more than they could possibly ever understand. We thank you for being with us here today and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.